Hello again. Welcome to our study in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I am Jeremy Robison. I am a elder here. I am an elder here, excuse me, at Emden Christian Church. This is a production of Emden Christian Church. And so you might be asking yourself, self, why are these Stone Campbell individuals going through a Presbyterian document. Well, I would say this. One, I don't believe that our congregation is very affiliated with the Stone Campbell movement anymore. Um, both pastors here are very reformed in our theology. We do not agree with certain uh, aspects of the Stone Campbell movement. We do not agree with them um, on salvation issues. Um, it is none of us. We have not given ourselves our own uh, salvation. We, have, we cannot be a part of that outside of receiving the gift of grace given to us by Christ. Um, so I think our Campbellite people would say, no, we have a little bit of it. We, we, we get to do this, this, and this. But that being said, um, we stand on a more reformed perspective. And so with that, I wanted to say, even though we may not agree with everything that is found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, we see it as something to, or at least I do, I see it as something that we can study and we can learn and we can gain insight into all things with. And so with that being said, we are going to go ahead and get into section six. That's what we're studying today. And before we do that, let us pray. Our God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Father, I pray that during this study, you are glorified and we are edified. Father, I thank you for this section, and I pray that you speak through me by, by the Holy Spirit. Father, I do thank you for this study and all that the Holy Spirit has, has taught me as I'm going through this. Father, again, I pray that this be edifying to the saints, whether it be here at MD Christian Church or those who might find it um, willy-nilly on YouTube. Uh, Father, I just thank you again for this study. I thank you for giving me the passion and want to go through this this document. Father, we love you and pray this in your son Jesus name. Amen. All right, so today um, as I'm studying through the Westminster Confession of Faith, I have found in this section, section 6, five yep, five things that I want to point out. I'll uh, we'll read through it and then I'll stop to to make the points. Uh, the first point I want to make is this. It's found in this part that is this highlighted says the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life. This is what is necessary for our Christian life. This is what is necessary for the believer. The whole counsel of God, first of all. We do not separate things. We take it from Genesis to Revelation, as they have already pointed out. All of that is is the word of God, it is the whole counsel of God. I don't know if you've ever thought about when you're reading the Bible that this whole thing is God's counsel for not just humanity, but for his people. That when his people read the Bible, they look at it and they can praise their God. Through the, through the Holy Spirit, through, through the Holy Spirit, they are able to look at the scripture and see what God has done for for the Christian, for the believer. And so this whole counsel of God, and what is a concern? All things necessary for his own glory. I don't know if you've ever thought about that when you read scripture, that we probably shouldn't put ourselves in the place of Abraham. We shouldn't put ourselves in the place of David. We shouldn't put ourselves in the place of all these, of all these individuals. Why not? Because when we put ourselves in the place of, say, David, we come up with concepts like, we can slay our Goliaths. These TED Talk nonsensical comments should be, de should be destroyed, thrown into the garbage, thrown back into hell where they, where they came from. Because the reality is, this whole counsel of God is first and foremost... For, show, to show his own glory, to show God's own glory. 
Why do you think Moses, when he writes Genesis, says, in the beginning, God? He doesn't start with Noah. He doesn't start with Abraham. He doesn't start, start with himself. He sees this big picture by the power of the Holy Spirit, nonetheless. He sees this whole picture. He sees what happens in the beginning is exactly what, what, he, what God needs to do to put them into the promised land for all of this time. Excuse the siren. It's 12 o'clock here. We still do that in our, in our day. And so Moses is not pointing us to, to Adam. He's not pointing us to, to Noah. He's not pointing us to, to Abraham or himself. He is pointing us to God. Why? Because it is for God's glory. Go read Genesis chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I wouldn't stop there. All of the things that are done is to show who our God is, to give him the place exactly where he belongs. He is the creator. He is our king. He is the mighty one. This whole counsel of God shows everything that is necessary for his own glory, to point to him, that is necessary for man's salvation, that is necessary, that is necessary for faith and life. Can I be quite frank? That's all we need. If we try to look through Scripture to try to find things on how to explore space or things on just nonsensical things that don't really matter in, in the whole of life, first of all, we're not going to be able to find it. Second of all, it's not stuff that's necessary. We search Scripture in order to praise our God, in order to see who we are in comparison to our God, that we are fallen creature, we are sons of Adam. That's why the gospel is powerful. is Because the gospel puts into perspective who we are, that we are not anything that deserves to be on a pedestal. Go read the, uh, go read the, the Tower, Tower of Babel. The whole reason why God knocks them down is because they do not belong. They do not belong in the position of calling their God down, nor are they in the position of going up to their God as if they are God. We are a created being who has the headship of Adam and needs the headship of Christ. That's what the Bible was written for, is to show, God, show who God is compared to us, that we are a, a being in need of someone to save us from our sins, from the wrath of God, and that being, and that awesome God is Jesus. That's the whole point of Scripture. It is all the things we need for that and for faith and life. That's what scripture is. As a whole counsel of God, it is what is necessary for us to know who our God is, to know who Jesus is, to know who we are, to know how to live by faith, to know how to live in this life. We don't need anything else. Okay? And so that's the first point. The second point is, is, is this is the next part here. There are two meanings of any text. When you look at any kind of book, you can see an ex explicit meaning and an implicit meaning. And so this next part is, is showing that, that this whole counsel of God is either expressly set down in Scripture which is the explicit, when you read a passage, you're like, oh yeah, okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That happened. That's the explicit meaning. Now there's some implicit meaning that we can get out of there, and that's the essentially the application of the text. But the, the explicit, the expressly set down in Scripture is, God created the heavens and the earth. We have a creator God. All right? So that's the explicit, the explicit meaning. Or... 
by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. We take the same Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see a God who created. Well, what's some implicit things? Well, implicit things are God is powerful. God is awesome. God is amazing. God is, uh, obviously, God is creator. God is sustainer. Uh, we can look at that and, and see that, that if God created it, he also sustains it. He's not going to create something willy-nilly. He's not going to create something that's, that's, um, that's not for any purpose, and so therefore he is purposeful. He is not reckless. When you look at, when you look at uh, chapters 1 through 3, you see who the reckless person is. The, the reckless entity is, and it's not God. God is purposeful. And so all of these things are implicit when you see when you see the text. The explicit, again, is just saying, this is what the text says. This is how it reads. It is, you could also say it is the plain reading of the text. And so that's, that's very important. We can see that the whole counsel of God is, is two things. It's either explicit or right there in the text you can read it and know what it means in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth or two there's implicit when you read the text the text brings out meaning that is also found in other parts of the text and that's the most important part you have to ha you have to have the explicit explain the implicit you cannot have the implicit explain the explicit and i believe that's that's where a lot of our um, our tradition has gone. We don't care about what is explicitly said in this text. We don't care that Paul says that women cannot be elders, women cannot be preachers. We, we, have, to get, we have to go past that and say implicitly, God has said that all people can give the gospel. Now, while that's true, we have to deal with the text. We have to deal with the text that Paul tells through the power of the Holy Spirit, through through the leading of the Holy Spirit, tells the church that women cannot be preachers. That's the explicit meaning. That's the clear and plain meaning. Now, there'll be texts that we come to, which there is one of them that I wanted to go to go to here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15, we have this these statements. And this was... Um, this was written down in their text. Um, it's something that I've been dealing with uh, as I'm studying this, trying to figure out what is actually being said. And so we see, the, see these words. Paul, says, Paul tells the Corinthian church, Be imitators of God, just as I also am of Christ. That's okay. This is explicit. The Corinthian church knew Paul. They knew who he was. They knew how he lived. And so he told them, be imitators of me. But not just of me, I am an imitator of Christ. Now this whole next section, essentially, I mean, he gets, he'll put his, um, his, his real meaning behind what is said later. But this is, this is essentially the whole point of what is to come. Paul is the leader, or Paul led these people to, to, to Christ. And so now he's saying, be imitators of me. Look at me. Look look how I live. Look look what I have ta taught. Live what I have taught. Live how I live. Live for Christ. But he's not the one, he's not pointing himself, pointing all of his fingers at himself. What he's saying is, I'm, an, I'm, not, I'm not, here's the thing, I'm not an original. I am, a, excuse me, I am an imitator of Christ. And this whole next section must be understood in this vein. Okay? Now, I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. What is to come explains this verse. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. 
this is the what you might call the natural order of things. Christ is the head of every man. Every man. And I want to say this. Every man means every man. Christ is king. He is the head of every man. However, this is more so for the church. If we are to be, again, going back to, excuse me, going back to what Paul has said, he, he commands the church to be imitators of him who, is, who he is an imitator of Christ. And it's exactly the exact same thing. The, the man who is the head of the household must be an imitator of Christ. This is explicit. This is teaching us, listen, man who is, a, who is the head of the household, man up and be like Christ. Wife, you are to cover your head. And again, that points to the fact that she is not the leader of the household. That's the whole point of this section. The whole point, the whole explicit point is, is found here. That Christ is the head of man, man is the head of head of, head of a wife. And it's probably, I don't actually I don't know what the Hebrew what the excuse me, what the Greek is there, but um, if it's wife, then or it's anyway, I don't want to go into that. But that's my point, is this is explicitly telling us that the man is the head of the wife. And so, and he goes into some things we'll come, come to later. Um, for a man ought not to have his head, head covered, since he is the image and the glory of, and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Talking about married relationships. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Going back to the creation. He, he pulls this back from the creation. Man was created first. God created woman from man is the order of the family. The man is the household, man is the head of the household. The woman is the is the one who is submissive or who is under the the husband as the husband is under Christ. That's what this section is all about. All right. And so that is expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequences may be deduced from Scripture. Going back to um, Genesis chapter chapter 1. Uh, I've been going through that in my own personal study. I've been pulling out things that, that when I read it, I think about. And so going back to that, what's implicitly, implicitly said that we can draw from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We can create, we can see that our God is an ordered God, our God uh, has structure. He isn't a reckless God. He is a loving God. Nowhere in the text does it say God is loving. Nowhere in the text does it say it does it say explicitly that God is an ordered God. But you can draw that from the text. But here's the point. Or here's well, let's 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 keep going. Uh, my third point is this. The third point I, thing I see in this is this: um, that nothing new can be added to Scripture. All right, so we've already said that this that the, the scripture is the whole counsel of God. It's concerning all things, all necessary things that we need in our lives. And we it has explicit meaning and it has implicit meaning. The next thing I want you to understand is this: that nothing new can be added to scripture. There are people who call themselves pastors who stand in front of a, a video screen, blowing away the coronavirus from our from our lives there is nowhere in scripture that that is taught nowhere and yet they seem that it is is good they seem they they say that it's it's fine but what they're doing is essentially adding these new revelations these quote unquote new revelations saying well i i i i heard it from god today the problem is that our scripture is closed, and we'll go into there's there's actually some things at the, the my fifth point that I want to bring up in that. But we must understand that our scripture is closed. There is nothing new to be added to be added, and know this: 
whether by new revelations of the Spirit. So if the Spirit decides one day, now I'll say this, he's not going to decide because it is believed um, that he doesn't need to do that anymore. Uh, we have the full revelations of Christ, res, revelation of Christ um, found in Scripture. Go read Hebrews 1. And so if, this, if the Spirit decided one day, you know what, I'm going to have a new revelation. Well, first of all, why? Second of all, we don't need any more revelation. And so to say that he would do that is just not possible because he, he wouldn't do, he wouldn't change anything. We are right now on a course to the end. We are in the last days, and that was abundantly clear in Scripture. All right, so I want to stop there to take us to 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 17. Paul writes to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. In this text, I see no reason for the for the Spirit to come come and say, you know what, I got more revelation for you. Paul is telling Timothy, listen, you have all you need. All you need that is found in in the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament that, that, that they read, everything that was taught by Paul, that was essentially taught by Christ. All of those teachings that the disciples handed down from Jesus, that's all we need. We don't need any more. Paul says, says this, hey, all this stuff, you know them, you're convinced of them, uh, you've learned them, uh, from, the, from that from your childhood, and, you, 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 and have known, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's all we need. Paul doesn't stop there. For you who believe that Scripture is, is the bane of the church, who decides to say, you know what? I'm just I'm gonna abandon the I'm gonna abandon the pulpit. I'm gonna abandon the Bible. I'm gonna abandon all these things. We're just gonna we're just gonna gussy up the worship band, shine them up real nice, allow them to, to lead people to, to Christ, to God. Problem is, they don't often do that. A lot of worship songs point to self. A lot of worship songs nowadays, new worship songs, lead, lead to a high worship of self and a low view of, of, of Christ in the scriptures. It's sad. And we need to change that. We need to go back to scripture and, and, and help us. And I pray that, that God helps us by the power of the Holy Spirit to understand, that, to understand what, is, what Paul writes here. All scripture is inspired by God. Meditate on that. I could put a say la there. All scripture is inspired by God. Why would we want anything else? Why would we want to create a stack of books to understand life when God has given us his very own word? This word that when you read in Genesis chapter 1, created light. Meditate on that. That our God created light. If that same word is exactly what leads us to Christ, why would we want anything else? And in this inspired word, it is profitable for teaching, 
for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness? If we abandon the scriptures, we're no longer training people to live for Christ. We're teaching them how to live for the world so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You know why people burn out? You know why pastors burn out? It's because they've abandoned, they've abandoned their first love. They've abandoned scripture. They've abandoned all that we see God doing in scripture. Now, don't get me wrong. There are days that I, that I feel down more often than not. But when I read scripture, my God picks me up. My God lifts me up. My God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is my fourth, my fourth point, or their fourth, fourth point. The Spirit illuminates. The Spirit illuminates. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. You can only understand both the explicit and the implicit by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God for the reader. If you can't understand it, it is because the Holy Spirit is not illuminating it for you. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians? Yeah, Second Thessalonians two, one through two. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to, to him, that you that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a or a letter, as if you as if come as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Why not? Because Paul has already taught them. We shouldn't worry. Because the Holy Spirit has illuminated these truths for us. Galatians chapter 1, 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say now again now. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what is what you received, he is accursed. We can be for sure that what is in Scripture is true. We can be for sure that the Scripture is illuminated to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. My last point, point five. So let me go back. The Bible has everything that is necessary for us. It is there is explicit truth and there's implicit truth implicit truth. The explicit explains the implicit, never the implicit explaining the explicit. Three, there is nothing new that can be added to Scripture either by new revelations of the Spirit or by man's, uh, man's or church, church tradition, which is that exactly what um, Galatians and Second Thessalonians has said. Fourth, uh, the Holy Spirit will illuminate the Word of God in order to save, save the, re the, the reader. Fifth, the order of worship and governing of the church can be gleaned from nature, Christian prudence, uh, and, and Christian prudence, and so, here is that. And that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. 
Okay, so there, there are some things in our in our world that can help us to understand how to govern the church, how to uh, order worship. The, the problem with that is a lot of the times we, we take whatever we can get. We take, uh, we take the, anybody who comes up with a worship scheme, we're like, oh, if it has Jesus on it, it's got to be fine, right? Well, the problem with that is these individuals understood that we need to look towards the Word of God in order to understand if what we're doing in the church setting is what God has wanted us to do or or not. Does that make sense? We we should not order ourselves by what the world wants to order order us by, but by what scripture wants us to order us by. Now we can do things that the world has. We can we can add instruments, we can um we can do other different things with our with our talents and our our skills. We can do that. But we must always look to Scripture in order to see if what we are doing is going to be glorifying to God. Okay? Um, so, in other words, what they said, um, those, those things that need to be done should be according to the general rules of, of the Word, um, which are always to be observed. All right? Um, and so we come back to this, um, the light of nature, um, Paul uses that in, in this, uh, the section, uh, talking about the head of the, the head of the household. Um, he says, for as the woman originates from man, so also the man has has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it uh, proper for a woman to pray to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it dishonors him? But if a woman has long hair, it is glory for her to her, for her hair is is given to her for a covering. All is saying is there is an order, and we can see that in nature. We can see that the woman has a head cover, and so she should be covered by the head of the household. She should live and be protected and um, be led to Christ by this individual. And so he's using items from nature to, ex to explain that. Um, he, let me see if I want to use this or not. Oh, yeah, I do want to use this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I think this is the, uh, the thing we need to understand. If we're going to be, if we're going to be leaders in the church, we need to understand, I think, this last part. Uh, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has interpretation. Now, a lot of us want to, a lot of charismatics and other leaders of the church like to just stop there. Oh, yeah, if you have a song and want to sing in front of a congregation, oh, it doesn't matter what the song is. Uh, we've had several times where somebody would come to us and say, I wanna, I'm going to sing the song. We look at the lyrics and it's like, uh, no, no, you, you won't be singing that song. Why not? If we stop there, we'd be like, oh, whatever. If you guys have a revelation, if you guys have a song, if you guys have a teaching, yeah, go ahead. Um, this part. Let all things done be done for edification. I may be stumbling through this lesson, but I pray that it's edifying. I'm not doing this, um, obviously, to hold myself up or this church up in high regards. I, I want this to be edifying. I want you to see Scripture as it is, I want you to understand that Scripture is the very Word of God. I want you to understand that the Scripture is is the, the the rule of faith and life. That it is what the church should be uh, should be organizing or ordering itself. 
after because it is the very word of God. Our God is telling us how to live. Our God is telling us how to order our services. And most of all, let all things done be done for edification. I pray that's the case. And again, he says in 1440, but all things must be done properly in an orderly manner. We have too many churches nowadays not doing anything in order. Too many things, entities calling themselves churches that do nothing in a, man, in a, in a properly or orderly manner. There are churches who have people who claim to be pastors standing in front, telling and touching these people, and they fall down. How is that orderly? How is that edifying? It's not. It shows a fake power, the, the power of suggestion. Church, we must understand the scripture is the key to understanding who our God is, to understanding who we are, to understanding who the church is, to understanding what the church's place in this world is. And if we get rid of it, all we're doing is living a lie. Church, let us get back to scripture. I praise God for the Westminster Confession of Faith because it is pointing me, me to Scripture as I pray that it points you to Scripture. With that being said, let us pray. Our God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to come and to, to teach, even though I am a stumbling tongue. I pray that this is edifying. I pray that the Holy Spirit um, edifies and helps to under, people to understand, even through my stammering tongue. Father, I love you, we love you, and I pray this in your Son's holy name. Amen. Go in peace, serve your Lord, praise God.